صل على محمد وآل محمد أعوذ بالله من الشيطان الرجيم بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم الحمد لله رب العالمين الرحمن الرحيم مالك يوم الدين إياك نعبد إياك نعبد وإياك نستعين الحمد لله رب العالمين الرحمن الرحيم ملك يوم الدين الرحمن الرحيم ملك يوم الدين إياك نعبد إياك نعبد وإياك نستعين اهدنا الصراط المستقيم صراط الذين انعمت عليهم غير المغضوب عليهم ولا الله أكبر الله أكبر بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم إِذَا الشَّمْسُ كُوِّرَتْ وَإِذَا النُّجُومُ كَدَرَتْ وَإِذَا الْجِبَالُ سُيِّرَتْ إذا الشمس كورت وإذا النجوب كدرت وإذا الجبال سيرت وإذا العشار عطلت 
وإذا الوحوش حشرت وإذا الموءودة سئلت بأي ذنب قتلت إذا الشمس كويرت وإذا النجوم كدرت وإذا الجبال سيرت وإذا العشار طلت وإذا الوحوش حشرت وإذا البحار سجرت وإذا النفوس زوجت وإذا الموءودة سئلت بأي ذنب قتلت وإذا الصحف نشرت وإذا السماء كشطت وإذا الجحيم سعرت وإذا الجنة أزلفت علمت نفسها ثم حضرت فلا أقسم بالخنس الجوار الكنس والليل إذا والصبح إذا تنفس إنه لقول رسول كريم ذي قوة عند ذي العرش مكين مطاع ثم مين وما صاحبكم بمجنون ولقد رآه بالأفق المبين وما هو على الغيب بظنين وما هو بقول شيطان رجيم فأين تذهبون إن هو إلا ذكر للعالمين لمن شاء وما تشاءون إلا أن يشاء الله رب العالمين صدق الله العلي العظيم صلوات Thank Brother Mushtaba for his outstanding citation.
uh, just to go through the program today inshallah we'll have a short poem by brother Taha Adil uh, after that will be the lecture main lecture by Sayyid Muhammad Baq Ghazwini and followed by that will be the Mawalid uh, can we please welcome Taha Adil with a loud salawat ala Muhammad wa ali Muhammad A twelfth petal. Freighted with hope, flushed with joy, a rose in between my heart gently flows. Infinite beauty, twelve luminous petals deploy, scatters the leaves of this opening rose. A stem, Fatima holds high the rose. Graceful rivers would stream in between. Tears will outpour as blood gently flows. Heartbeats chanting the sacred 14. Twelve shining petals orbiting his scent. Muhammad, roots of this embedded love. My heart no longer encaged with torment. Flying, singing, and as free as a dove. When the twelfth petal drops, he shall emerge. The milky moon will bow in respect. The morning sun will sink and submerge. For he is the Mahdi and he will perfect. Salah ala Muhammad. In desperation I search, look and seek. His location through the heart that leaks. Each time the graceful birds are flying, my heart and soul unite in sighing. Every night as the moon peers down and the sky adorns its twilight gown, I look between the hazy stars and through the shadows they despair for a glimpse of him. For a glimpse of him, he who waits under for a glimpse of him, he who waits under moonlit nights for destined fate. But every night I failed on my pursuit. So Satan played my sinful flute. I began to find home in sinful temptations and saw the world through aberrations. Even as the sun beamed down on wild green, misted light pervaded the scene. Blind to beauty I became. Hopeless, a dire sense of shame. His existence I ignored and swayed. The great descendant I betrayed. The truth was that it did not really matter what the eyes did see even if it did but flatter for it is a painting of what the heart does utter and my heart now and now knowing this can flutter for i have seen the mehdi's light and it rises beyond this mortal sphere to join lights with the hearts he holds there so tonight as the moon shines at me below i can finally look upwards for my heart with the clear glow so i know Great poem by Brother Taha Adil. For more of his poems, please visit cyconline.co.uk. Uh, now we welcome the Sayyid with the main lecture with Allah Salawat ala Muhammad wa Ali Muhammad. Can we have a second Salawat for the love of Ali? And with your loudest voices, Salawat ala Muhammad wa Ali Muhammad. Before we start the lecture, could we please ask the sisters to keep it quiet during the lecture? Thank you very much. And the brothers. أعوذ بالله من الشيطان الرجيم بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم والصلاة والسلام على أشرف الأنبياء والمرسلين 
حبيب إله العالمين أبي القاسم المصطفى محمد وعلى أهل بيته الطيبين الطاهرين لا سيما بقية الله في الأراضين إمامنا وسيدنا الحجة بن الحسن المهدي أرواح العالمين له الفدا الله سبحانه وتعالى استيت صلّى الله قرآن بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم إنما يريد الله ليذهب عنكم الرجس أهل البيت ويطهركم تطهيرا صدق الله العلي العظيم 14 centuries ago the holy prophet peace be upon him made a great announcement the prophet made a proclamation to the entire human race he gave us a formula to success to salvation to eternal salvation the Prophet stated, إِنِّي تَارِكُمْ فِيكُمُ الثَّقَلَيْنِ أَوْ الثَّقْلَيْنِ I have left behind me, I have left amongst you two very weighty, heavy, important things. كتاب الله وعترتي أهل بيتي The book of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and my progeny the Ahlul Bayt, peace be upon them. The Prophet then makes a firm statement that if you hold on to them, مَا إِن تَمَسَّكْتُمْ بِهِمَا لَن تَظِلُّوا بَعْدِ أَبَدًا If you hold on to these two weighty things, the book of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and my progeny, you shall never go astray. You shall never deviate from the right path. He gave us that universal divine formula to success. By holding on to the book of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and the progeny, the Ahlul Bayt, peace be upon them. In order for us to understand and come to explore the meaning of this statement, how is it that the book of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and especially the Ahlul Bayt can guarantee success to all of us? Can it guarantee eternal happiness, eternal bliss for all of humankind? The Holy Prophet, peace be upon him, it was his responsibility to deliver the message of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to the people. He was the final of all messengers, the seal of prophets. The Prophet, peace be upon him, had a very short time. Through this short time, he had the opportunity to bring to humanity the religion of Islam. The Prophet only had 23 years. At the age of 40, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala descended the revelation upon him. It is at that age that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala gave him the holy message, the holy Qur'an, and asked him to deliver it to the people. The Prophet, peace be upon him, had to make sure that he succeeds with the help of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, of course. The Prophet was well aware of the experiences of previous Prophets. What kind of struggles they had to endure. What kind of problems they experienced. The, pro the Prophet was well aware of that. The Prophet, peace be upon him, knew that Prophet Nuh for 950 years struggled with his people. After 950 years, how many people believed in Prophet Nuh? About 80 people, as the hadith says. 80 two or 83 people. Imagine 950 years preaching to your community, to your people, and at the end, only 80 or so believe in you. And look at the message of all of other prophets. The divine books 
that were revealed to them from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and how people changed those books, added to them, subtracted from them. They tampered with the holy books. And they inserted their own opinions, their desires, their temptations, dictated to them what they wanted to see in the book. And they changed the divine books of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. The Prophet was well aware of this. The Prophet did not want this to happen to the Holy Quran, to the religion of Islam. The Prophet had to make sure that the book of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala remains pure till the day of judgment. That the religion of Islam does not become changed and tampered with and distorted. Yes, even though the religion of Islam in future days after the Holy Prophet, peace be upon him, there will come groups of Muslims who will change aspects of it. But the Prophet had to guarantee that at least one group has the truth and will not change the truth. In order to achieve this great accomplishment, the Holy Prophet, peace be upon him, had to embrace all Muslims and all Arabs at that time through his gentle touch, through his amazing moral code, ethical code, mannerism, the Holy Prophet, peace be upon him, attracted everyone. The Prophet, according to the Holy Quran, when he was in Mecca, but more so in Medina, the Prophet was surrounded with hypocrites. People who acted as if they were Muslims, but in fact, they did not believe in Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, nor did they believe in Islam. The Prophet knew that. Allah revealed an entire chapter in the Holy Quran called Surah Al-Munafiqun. The chapter of the hypocrites. Those who act as if they believe, but they do not believe. The Holy Prophet, peace be upon him, did not expose these people. He was very gentle and he tried to embrace everyone to make sure that the religion of Islam continues to survive. And it wouldn't happen to this religion what happened to Christianity, to Judaism. The entire religion changed. The very divine book changed after those holy prophets, after Prophet Isa salam and Prophet Musa salam. Therefore the Prophet used this method of embracing everyone so that the religion becomes strengthened. The result of this effort and this approach, the Qur'an describes in the Holy Qur'an. In Surah Al-Nasr, when Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala states, Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim, إِذَا جَاءَ نَصْرُ اللَّهِ وَالْفَتْحِ the result, the Quran states, you see the people embracing the religion of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in large groups, in large crowds, group after group. And this is by far one of the greatest achievements of the Holy Prophet, peace be upon him. For 23 years, during such a limited time, how can one man, change the condition of the Arabian Peninsula, of the pagans, of the time of ignorance as the Prophet refers to and as the Quran mentions. Indeed, it is through the support that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala gave him but also through his approach and through his genius way in gathering all the Muslims. The Prophet, peace be upon him, therefore, before he left, he made this announcement to humanity that if you want to stick to the truth after me, hold on to the book of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and my Ahlul Bayt. One may wonder, and this is a valid question that poses itself, how is it that the Ahlul Bayt protected the message after the Holy Prophet, peace be upon him? What is it that they did in order to protect the religion of Islam? How is it that if we hold on to them, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will protect us and we shall never go astray? If we briefly 
examine the history of the religion of Islam and the events that took place after the Holy Prophet peace be upon him it will be very clear to us what an important role the Ahlul Bayt peace be upon them had in protecting the message of the Holy Prophet and the religion of Islam after the Holy Prophet peace be upon him was martyred and passed away Imam Ali ibn Abi Talib salam, while he was busy preparing the Holy Prophet for burial, gathering and collecting the Holy Quran, the book of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, the Muslims were busy choosing their own ruler, choosing their own caliph, thereby disobeying the Holy Prophet peace be upon him. After the Holy Prophet peace be upon him, the a group of Muslims, they came into power and the Islamic government was now in their hands. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, there is a reason why He chooses an Imam for us. An Imam is not to be chosen by the people. When Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has appointed and selected someone for us, we have no right in choosing our leader. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala states in the Holy Quran, Ya Dawood, inna ja'alnaaka khalifatan fil ar. O David, we have selected you to be the caliph, the ruler, the leader on earth. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala chooses the prophets and the imams because Allah knows the imam very well. Allah has purified the imam. Therefore, the imam only is qualified to represent the Holy Prophet, peace be upon him. We people, when we gather, when we choose someone, we have no full knowledge about this person. Only Allah knows my reality and your reality. But we people, we do not know the reality of one another. Allah knows whether this Imam is sincere or not, whether he is qualified or not. However, a group of Muslims decided to choose their own Khalifa and their own leader after the Holy Prophet, peace be upon him. The Quran gives us a warning. If a leader is not selected by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, no matter who that person is, obviously we will not have that protection from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. That leader will not have that divine guidance from God. And anyone who does not have guidance from God will deviate. The Holy Quran states, Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim, إِنَّ الْإِنسَانَ لَيَطْغَى أَنْ رَآهُ استغنى. The human being becomes corrupt once he feels empowered. If you don't have a strong faith, a faith which is guided by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, once you are given wealth, once you are given power, you tend to deviate. Because the shaitan will come to you and he will use this area of your weakness in order to cause you to deviate from the right path. Therefore, what happened after the Holy Prophet, peace be upon him, is that the Muslim Ummah deviated. And they did not stick to the commandments of the Holy Prophet, peace be upon him. One may wonder, why is it that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala allows for us to deviate? Where does evil come from? To even expand more on this question, many people ask, where does evil come from? If Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is our creator, and He's nothing but goodness, then where did all this evil, where do all these problems and disasters and evils come from? What is the source? of all this evil? This is a very valid question. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, in fact, He's the one who has created evil. Who created the devil, the shaitan? Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Even the shaitan, he himself admits this and acknowledges that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has created him. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has created evil 
and has allowed us human beings to deviate although he's shown us the right path and the wrong path we choose but Allah has allowed us to deviate for a number of reasons and this is from the beautiful system of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala Allah has allowed us to deviate first and foremost in order to test us if there is no evil how will you be tested if there is no difficulty if there are no hardships how can you be tested it is only with the presence of evil the bad side the wrong side that you can be tested otherwise every human being will be good and there's no way to discern who is a true believer from the one who is not therefore Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has given you these two paths ahead of you and he has created evil in our lives simply to test us there's nothing wrong with that there is no imperfection here it is from the perfect system of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala that there are imperfections imperfections are beautiful according to the religion of Islam according to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala we think they're imperfections but they're actually not perfections they're perfect for the purpose that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has created us for when you take an exam imagine you go to school to your university one day the professor distributes the exam you flip the exam it's a multiple choice exam and you tell the professor excuse me sir there is a huge flaw there's a huge problem in this test he tells you what exactly is this problem he'll tell you the student will tell the professor look professor this test is full of wrong answers every question has about three or wrong answers exactly the professor will tell you that's the whole point and that's exactly why you are here there is no flaw in this test this test is a multiple choice examination every question has three or four wrong answers and one right answer it is up to you as a diligent serious student who has supposedly studied and not wasted his or her time to select the right answers without the presence of wrong answers there can be no test how will your professor test you Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has allowed us to deviate Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has created evil simply to test us because this world is a life of test and there's nothing wrong in that even the natural disasters the other imperfections as we see them of course they're perfect in the eyes of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala they fit beautifully in the system of life when a knife cuts your hand does that mean that there's a flaw in this life or in the way that physics works so that a knife cuts your hand absolutely not when a knife cuts your hand there doesn't mean that there's a flaw in your hand or in the knife because when your mother wants to cook in the kitchen she has to use this knife to cut, cut to cut the vegetables if a knife would not cut we could not do many of the things we do therefore it is from the perfect system of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala that he has allowed for so-called imperfections without these imperfections as we see them of course they're perfect according to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala then the human being could not be tested Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in a number of traditions and a hadith has explained to us very beautifully why we face tragedies in this life why are we subjected to difficulties and hardships in this life first of all one reason why Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala exposes us to tragedies and difficulties to trials and tribulations is so that we repay for our sins in this life to pay off 
for the mistakes we have committed. Which one would you rather choose? To pay off your sins in the grave, on the here, in the hereafter, on the day of judgment, or here in this life, through a tragedy, through a problem, through a difficulty? Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala sometimes exposes us to tragedies, to difficulties, to hard tests, to elevate our status. One hadith states on the day of judgment, when a person sees how much reward he has given by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala because for one night he suffered from fever, he was sick, on the day of judgment he will wish he had fever his entire life when he sees the reward for that. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala sometimes punishes us or inflicts us with a tragedy to elevate our status. The Imams, the Prophets, they had no sins. Why is it that they suffered from so many tragedies? So that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala elevates their status. And of course, sometimes Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, when everything else fails, when the Qur'an fails to guide this person. Of course, the Qur'an doesn't fail, but the person fails in being guided by the Holy Qur'an. When everything else fails, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala sometimes to awaken that person. Because that person has been submerged in the world of materialism, forgetting about the hereafter and forgetting about Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Allah disciplines that person through a tragedy and he wakes up. I remember there was a respected sister in the United States. For a while, she was far away from religion, very distant. She had nothing to do with religion. Then, about five or six years ago, she went to the doctor and she was diagnosed with cancer, God forbid. She said after a while, after several months, of course she was upset. She was very disappointed and she was experiencing so many difficulties with her cancer but she said I thank Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala for inflicting me with cancer because this was the only way to cause me to open my eyes and see the way ahead of me and prepare for my hereafter and I thank Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala because now once I, meet, I see myself in this state I truly am convinced and believe that you know what life will end one day and sooner than you think prepare for that other life which is eternal which is our final abode and final destination for these simple reasons Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has allowed humanity to deviate and this is exactly what happened after the Holy Prophet peace be upon him Allah could have saved the Muslim Ummah the entire Ummah but to test us Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala wanted to see how we go about managing our own affairs. Allah gave us the formula and He set and appointed a leader for us. But the Muslim Ummah disobeyed the Holy Prophet, peace be upon him. And disobeyed Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and they established their own government. So let's try to understand the importance of the role of Ahlul Bayt and exactly how is it that they protected the religion of Islam. From what type of dangers did they protect the religion of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala? After the Holy Prophet, the Muslims, after they came into power, they were now faced with a problem. The Prophet, for all these years, every single day, he would mention something important about his Ahlul Bayt. Thousands upon thousands of hadith and narrations were made by the Holy Prophet, peace be upon him, to illustrate and portray the status of Ahlul Bayt. During the Prophet's time, Muslims would memorize many of these hadith. Most of them would not record the hadith. Some of them would. But the Muslims would mainly memorize these teachings and traditions from the Holy Prophet. And all Muslims knew very well that the Prophet had appointed Ahlul Bayt to succeed after him. Now, 
the Muslims who were in power, who were controlling the Islamic government at that time, were faced with a problem. What are you going to do with all these Muslims who had heard the Prophet, saw the Prophet, how he elevated the status of Ahlul Bayt, and how he firmly stated that they are the ones to represent him after him. They had to devise a plan. The Muslim Ummah was expanding and expanding day after day. New Muslims were joining the faith every single day. Some of them who were in the holy city of Medina and Mecca had seen the Prophet. But for those new Muslims, they had not seen the Prophet. The only way that they would get their teachings from the Holy Prophet was through the body, the large body of ahadith and narrations which were memorized by the Muslims. The Muslims therefore began to record the ahadith. They started during the Prophet's life and especially right after his martyrdom or his departure, they wanted to record these narrations so they do not lose them and so they can transmit them to other Muslim societies in the Muslim world. Therefore, the plan that these Muslim group, the caliphs, developed in order for these new Muslims and the Muslim Ummah generally does not look to Ahlul Bayt, does not te take its teachings from the household of the Holy Prophet, peace be upon him. They began to prohibit the recording of hadith. This is a new agenda that they started to prohibit every single hadith from being recorded the first caliph himself he had recorded 500 hadith 500 narrations that he heard from the holy prophet peace be upon him after becoming the caliph he burned all of these hadith and this was the overall system that they were using after the holy prophet to alienate Ahlul Bayt or alienate the Muslim community from Ahlul Bayt, peace be upon them. In fact, one of the caliphs, he claimed that he wanted to gather all of the narrations of the Holy Prophet, peace be upon him. So he told the companions, go and gather and make a huge collection of all of the hadith. Many of the companions were excited. All of these narrations should be protected and should be recorded. So from all areas of the Muslim Ummah, they gathered the Ahadith and they gave it to the Caliph. And as soon as he received this large collection of the Prophet's Ahadith, he burned them all immediately. Simply to make sure that the status, the true status of Ahlul Bayt is not known to all Muslims at that time. And this is the new system that they developed and continued to advance. That was the first stage. It was at the stage of prohibiting the ahadith from being circulated around the Muslim Ummah and from being recorded. Even the Holy Quran after a while was not allowed to be discussed by the Muslims. One day a man, a young man, came to one of the caliphs and he asked him, O oh, Caliph, O oh, the one whom you represent, the Holy Prophet, peace be upon him. What is the meaning of this verse? What is the meaning of this verse? Immediately upon hearing this question from this young man, the Caliph ordered his guards to imprison this young man and they beat him several times simply because he asked what this verse meant. They did not want the true teachings of the Holy Prophet to emerge, to reach the people. Because if the true teachings of the Prophet would reach the people, that would put them under question and their authority under question. And they did not want that to happen. So after a number of years, this is the system that they employed in order to make sure that the status of Ahlul Bayt is not discovered by the people. You can imagine what kind of damage that presented the Muslim world? What kind of effects and influences 
that had on the Muslim Ummah. After a while, now they realize that now there's a problem. The Prophet for 23 years, he had trained the Muslims to always hear his ahadith, hear new statements, new teachings every single day. Now suddenly all of these ahadith are being prohibited from being recorded and from being circulated in the Muslim Ummah. There was now a huge gap and the Muslims were becoming uneasy about this. The Prophet had trained them to learn something new every single day, to hear a hadith every single day. Therefore, they had to come up with alternatives to fill this void and fill this gap. They came up after the Holy Prophet, peace be upon him, with five, basically, five alternatives in order to fill this gap and fill this void. The first alternative was that they encouraged and caused storytellers to be spread in every mosque in the Muslim Ummah. So every village, every city, when you would go to the mosque, there would be a storyteller, a person who would sit from morning till night and basically relay stories to the Muslims. That was one way of keeping them intellectually busy. So they don't ask about Ahl al-Bayt. They don't ask about the teachings of the Holy Prophet, peace be upon him. Imam Ali ibn Abi Talib salam, took a very firm stance against the storytellers. Sometimes he would threaten them to beat them if they continue. Because many times they would e either make up the stories or take stories from people of the book, from Ahl al-Kitab, from non-Muslims and try to infiltrate them into Muslim society. One day Imam Ali ibn Abi Talib salam, heard that the storytellers were now telling a new story. They were telling the story of Prophet Dawood and his incident that occurred with Uriah, which is mentioned in the Bible, that one day when he went on the roof of his house, he was looking around in his neighborhood, and suddenly he saw a woman who was bathing. And then the shaitan came to him, to the Prophet of God. And these storytellers were now relaying these stories to the Muslim Ummah. Her husband was fighting in his army. So he caused her husband to fight at the front lines so he would be killed. And then after that, he married her as these storytellers would tell the Muslims. Of course, the Bible states that God forbid, Prophet Dawood committed adultery with her. And as a result of this, Prophet Sulaiman was born. These were influenced by such ideologies and such concepts. And this was one alternative that they used to fill this void. When Imam Ali ibn Abi Talib heard this, he became infuriated. And he said, I swear by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, if I hear anyone mentioning this false story, I will apply the had, the punishment of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala because he's accusing Prophet David of something grave, of a grave sin. This was one alternative. The second alternative that they used was spreading poetry. The Arabs, it was in their genes and their blood to love poetry. And the second caliph would encourage the people to go and spread poetry to keep the people busy. We find that similar in our days through the entertainment industry, through the media industry, how they keep the masses, how they keep the people busy so they do not see the reality of what's going on around the world. So they are, for example, in the United States, one of the ways the U.S. distracts its citizens from knowing what goes on in their foreign policy is through the entertainment industry. That's one way that they have sought control over the masses to simply distract them. Once you keep the people busy with something, they don't meddle into other aspects of your government, of your society. This was a second alternative. The third alternative that the second caliph really encouraged was the science of ancestry. Arabs would sit and 
make discussions with one another, make circles with one another to discuss the ancestry of the Arabs, the line of ancestry. And this was something very important to them. One day the Holy Prophet, peace be upon him, came to the masjid and he saw that there was a commotion. The Muslims were occupied and they were busy with doing something. The Prophet, peace be upon him, said, what's going on? They said, oh Prophet, a very, very knowledgeable person is here in the masjid and we're gathered to benefit from him. The Prophet said, a knowledgeable, a knowledgeable person? Why? What is he teaching you? They said, this guy is the most knowledgeable person in Arab ancestry. The Prophet, peace be upon him, began to laugh. And he said, this is a science that it will not benefit you if you learn it. And it will, it will not harm you if you do not know it. It's something which is in vain, purposeless, useless. But this was an alternative that they used. A fourth alternative because now they had prohibited the hadith from being recorded, was to go to the people of the book, to Ahlul Kitab, was to go to them and seek the knowledge from them. And this was something devastating to the Muslim Ummah. There was this Jewish person living amongst the Muslim. His name was Ka'b al-Ahbar. This man had this hatred towards Imam Ali ibn Abi Talib alayhi salam, towards Amir al-Mu'mineen alayhi salam. And they would go to him every once in a while, frequently actually, to seek knowledge from him. Whenever a new idea would cross the minds of the Muslims, they would go to him. Especially the second caliph, he, was, he used to glorify Ka'b al-Ahbar. And he used to see him as a very scholarly figure. And he would encourage the Muslims, if they had any questions, to go to him and to ask him. Imagine what damage this guy caused in the Muslim Ummah, in the Muslim Empire. The fifth alternative was to only allow a few to narrate the hadith. The average person was banned from narrating a hadith from the Holy Prophet, peace be upon him, except for a few. For example, Aisha was allowed to narrate the hadith. Abu Musa al-Ash'ari was allowed to narrate the hadith. Abu Huraira, in the beginning, he was banned. But then, after a while, once the system, once the government at that time realized that it is in their advantage to allow Abu Huraira to narrate the hadith, once again, they allowed him to do so. And Abu Huraira began to forge and forge thousands of ahadith. For only a limited number of time, he narrated over 4,000 hadiths. And if you go to Sahih al-Bukhari, you'll realize that Imam Ali ibn Abi Talib salam, the son-in-law, the cousin of the Holy Prophet, who was with him for 30 years, only 30 or so ahadith have been narrated from him. This tells you there is something wrong over here. Now briefly, let's see the result of such an agenda and such a system which was in place after the Holy Prophet, peace be upon him. As a result of prohibiting the recording of hadith, the Muslims began to be ignorant of the most obvious and simple issues. That's it. The whole intellectual system, the whole Islamic culture that the Prophet gave to them was being destroyed. To give you an example, for example, Abu Musa al-Ash'ari narrates, he says after Imam Ali ibn Abi Talib salam became the Khalifa, he led us in his prayer. We went to pray behind him. After they finished their salah, Abu, Abu Musa looked towards his friend and he told him, ذَكَّرَنَا بِصَلَاةِ مُحَمَّدِ اللَّهُمَّ صَلِّ عَلَىٰ مُحَمَّدِ He reminded us of the prayer of the Holy Prophet, peace be upon him. What does that tell you? It tells you that prayer had changed so much that when Imam Ali ibn Abi Talib prayed, the companions say, oh, he remembered, he reminded us how the Prophet used to pray. This is one example. Another example, the Muslims 
during the time of the fourth Imam, Zain al Abidin, even the Hashimis, those who were supposedly close to Ahlul Bayt, they did not know the most basic laws of the Hajj. Even the Hajj had changed so much, and Muslims had forgotten how the Prophet did his Hajj, performed his pilgrimage, and they had no clue. To give you a third example, one of the caliphs, he sent Abu Musa al-Ash'ari to an entire army who was fighting in Iraq because this army did not know that if they are out of water and they want to pray, they want to do wudu, if they are out of water that they have to do tayammu. An entire Muslim army did not know that. That tayammum comes after wudu. If you don't have water, you do tayammu, which is mentioned in the Holy Quran. This was the drastic state of the Muslim Ummah at that time. To give you a final example, in a city in Iraq, there was this Muslim man who came from a respected tribe. Every Friday, he would lead Friday prayers and he would give a lecture, a sermon. After a while, he wrote a letter to the wali, to the ruler of that area, and he told him, I am tired of delivering these Friday speeches every week. Can you please find someone else to do this? The ruler said, please, I beg you, you have to do this because no one else is qualified. He said, all these tribes and they have respected individuals from these tribes. Why don't they do so? So he told them, fine, next week, let me prove to you that you're only qualified. He told him, fine. The following week came, the wali, the ruler, told him, you go behind the wall of the masjid to hear what's going on, and I will ask them to lead the prayer and deliver the sermon. So the ruler comes, the wali comes inside the mosque, and he tells him, your regular imam is not present today. He's absent. So one of you, please, come give the sermon and lead the prayer. So he looks at a few respected tribes, noble tribes. One of them stands up. He ascends the podium and he begins to give a lecture. He starts off his lecture by saying, Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. Alhamdulillah al-Ladhi khalaq as-samawati wal-ard fi sittati ashwar. May the praise be due to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala who has created the skies and the earth in six months. Immediately he caused an uproar in the masjid. They told him, Qabbahak Allah, may Allah make your face ugly. Allah says in the Quran, six days, and you say six months? They dragged him down from the mimbar, from the podium. The next person then was selected to deliver a sermon. He got up on the mimbar. He became nervous now. He doesn't know what to say. Not because he was embarrassed or shy, but because... He was ignorant. He did not know what to say. This was a result of prohibiting the hadith. The Muslims, their state of awareness, their Islamic knowledge was so shallow, they did not know the most simple things. He got up on the mimbar. Suddenly he spotted someone bald. And in front of everyone he said, Oh people, witness that when I come down from this mimbar, I will do so and so to this bald man because he had some problems with this bald man previously. So they dragged him down. The third person ascends the mimbar and once he feels so embarrassed in that state, he tells the Muslims, all of you bear witness that now I am divorcing my wife because today I did not want to come to Salat al Jummah. But my wife put pressure on me. She said, please go. There is so much reward in it. You'll learn this and that. And because of her, I came here and now I'm in this embarrassing situation. So everyone bear witness that I divorced my wife. So he came down from the room, but they dragged him. Then the ruler called on their regular imam. He told him, come now and deliver your lecture. You see the state of these people. I'm telling you, they're not qualified. Once he ascended the pulpit and delivered his sermon, they all realized how great he was now in their eyes. This was the result, my respected brothers and sisters, of this policy that was taken after the Holy Prophet, peace be upon him. 
And here comes the role of Ahlul Bayt, peace be upon them, who saved the religion of Islam. It is therefore no wonder that the four schools of thought emerged when? Not during the time of the Prophet, during the time of Imam al-Sadiq who was now preaching the religion of Islam and bringing to the world, to the Muslims, the ahadith which were banned for such a long time. This is why at that time, the four schools of thought emerged. And it is at that time that they were established due to the blessings of the Imam. Because before that, there was nothing. There were no real Islamic sciences. Due to this policy, the Islamic heritage that the Prophet had left was destroyed. And it was up to Ahlul Bayt, peace be upon them, to revive the ahadith of the Holy Prophet, peace be upon him. And then Imam Sadiq salam did so. This is the role of Ahlul Bayt, my respected brothers and sisters. Until this day, Al Imam Al Mahdi Ta'ala Farajo Sharif continues to play this role. Through the mere existence of the Imam, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala gives us the blessings. Because the Imam represents the continuation of the line of the Holy Prophet, peace be upon him. The Imam represents the full intellect that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has created. And Allah created the universe for this intellect. The Imam continues to guide us at a spiritual level, at a personal level. And the Imam also continues to guide our scholars. The Prophet, peace be upon him, says, Ahlu bayti fikum fil ard kan nujum. The Prophet says, My Ahlul Bayt are like the stars. Just as the stars serve to keep the universe together, just like the sun through its gravitational force serves to keep the solar system together, so does my Ahlul Bayt keep together the earth and this life that we live in. Therefore, every Muslim is indebted to the role of the Imam, peace be upon him. And we ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to hasten his reappearance and make us all amongst his sincere servants because there is no alternative. The only path that the Prophet gave us is Ahlul Bayt. When he said that my Ahlul Bayt are like the Ark of Nuh, the ship of Nuh. The one who rides it shall be saved. The one who doesn't shall drown and go astray. There is no other alternative. The son of Prophet Nuh told his father that, My father, Sa'awi ila jabalin ya'simuni. I will go to a mountain which will protect me from the wrath of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Prophet Nuh told him, La asim al yawma min amrullah. Today, no one shall be saved except for those who enter this ark of salvation. And the Imams, the Ahlul Bayt, are the Ark of Salvation. We ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to forgive us all our sins, to allow us to become closer to the path of Ahlul Bayt. We ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to grant us the intercession of the Holy Prophet, peace be upon him, and his immaculate progeny, and to hasten the reappearance of our Imam, Imam Al Mahdi, Ajjallahu ta'ala, Farajahu Sharif. والسلام عليكم ورحمة الله وبركاته We thank the Sayyid for his excellent lecture uh, Can we have another salawat? Salawat ala Muhammad wa ala Muhammad uh, For those of you who are for eager for more there will be a special Q&A session after the food uh, without further ado, I'd like to welcome Brother Ali Fadl for the Muwalid. And now with your loudest voices, Sallu ala Muhammad wa Ali Muhammad. صلى على محمد وآل محمد
أزف لكم أسماء آيات التهاني والتبريكات على المولد البهيج السعيد ميلاد الإمام صاحب العصر والزمان إمام المهدي عجل الله تعالى فرجه الشريف Brothers, sisters, scholars and community leaders السلام عليكم ورحمة الله وبركاته طرب الزمان طرب الزمان بسحر صوت المنشيد طرب الزمان بسحر صوت المنشد بمديح خير الأنبياء جادي وكأنه بلسان حال فؤاده نادى بكل موحد متودد إن مر ذكر المصطفى إن مر ذكر المصطفى في مجلس أدم الصلاة على النبي محمد يا حجة الله يا حجة الله يا برهان يا مظهر الجود يا عنوان نورك بهالكون عمر كان والفرح معقود وانت ويانا دلالي ناداك دلالي ناداك هاك الحانة اهلا اهلا يا موعود يا مولانا يا بهجة رواح أهلا يا مهدينا صلوات نعم صلوات 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 حفظيها صلوات اسمع يا مهدي يا مهدي return back to us يا مهدي يا مهدي return back to us صلوات صلوات صوتك صلوات 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 الصوت نايمين نايمين اكيد نايمين واتون صلواتون يا مهدي يا مهدي return back to us يا مهدي يا مهدي return back to oh my master and protector 
Oh, pure light in my darkest times. Oh, my master and protector. Oh, pure light in my darkest times. You are patience. You are rahmah. You are of hope. Saints, holy nine. Never will go out this fire between your heart and between mine stronger than all my desires I await you and your great signs never will go out this fire between your heart and between mine stronger than all my desires I await you and your great sign stronger than all my desires I await you and your great signs Ya Mahdi Ya Mahdi we need you with us Ya Mahdi Ya Mahdi return back to us Salawat Salawatun Salawat, 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 Ya Mahdi, Ya Mahdi, Ya Mahdi, return back to us. Ya Mahdi, Ya Mahdi, return back to were it not for your existence, I would sway not, knowing my path. Who would guide me? Who would love me? Who would put me first and not last? Who would take my hand to Jannah like a father takes his child? We are in need of you, Mahdi, and blessings on you we will cast. Were it not for your existence, I would sway not, knowing your path. Who would guide me? Who would love me? Who would put me first and not last? Who would guide me? Who would love me? Who would put me first and not last? Ya Mahdi, Ya Mahdi, you are within us. Ya Mahdi, Ya Mahdi, return back to us. Salawat, 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 salawat. Let us say, Ya Mahdi, Ya Mahdi, Ya Mahdi, return back to us. Ya Mahdi, Ya Mahdi, return back to us. Salallahu Muhammad wa Ali Muhammad. The world, the world is in the search of you. Naam, the world is in the search of you. The blow of air brings the message of you. Every morning brings new hope of life. But the life is nothing without you. Oh, my beloved Imam. Oh, my beloved Imam. Look at us. We are in the great need of you. Look at the miserable life of Muslims. They are crying in the pain for you. You are the dreams of Almighty, the hope 
for the weak who rely on you my morning is sad and my evening is too I passed my days thinking thinking of you Salawat Adam Salu 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 Ala Muhammad Wa Ali Bayti Ahmed Salu 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 Ala Muhammad Wa Ali Bayti Salu 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 I hear more clapping than I hear voices. Ali Bayti Ahmed Salu Salu Muhammad Wa Ali Bayti Ahmed Bi wujudak tabil sahar Halila wa saharna Wa naanik najm al-sima Wa naghaz al-badrna بوجودك طاب السهر هالليلة وسهرنا ونعانق نجم السماء ونعانق نجم السماء ونغاز البدرنا مرخص لك يا ابن الحسن مرخص لك يا ابن الحسن لو تطلب عمرنا ونهدي لك حتى النفس نهدي لك حتى النفس بالمحفل حضرنا بالمحفل حضرنا صلوا 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 على محمد وآل بيتي جواب صلوا 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 على محمد وآل بيتي how can I lie to myself? You are Mahdi. I'd rather die than leave you. I'd rather die than leave you. Oh, son of Ali. Mawla, I know that you are heaven's pure key. My weak heart hurts from loving you and let it be. You and let it be. Salu, salu. Salu, jawab رحمة الله وديك. Salu على محمد وعلي بيت أحمد. Salu. ما شاء الله أي صوتك. Salu على محمد وعلي بيت أحمد. هل ليه مل محب؟ ويبين وداعدا وبالبهجة قلب شغف. تغمرنا السعادة ميلادك فرحة قلب ميلادك فرحة قلب يا محلى الولادة كل عاشق فيك نعشق كل عاشق فيك نعشق وبصوت حب نادى وبصوت حب نادى صلوا 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 على محمد وآل بيت أحمد صلوا صلوا ما شاء الله صلوا على It is my dream يا مهدي to see your face ما شاء الله ما شاء الله it is my dream, Ya Mahdi, to see your face And by your side fight with you in every place With your Ansar I will serve With your Ansar I will serve With your Ansar I will serve in every case And to Jannah with Mahdi And to Jannah with Mahdi In every place in every place, salu, salu. Wali 
حبيت يا حبات صلوا صل اي هالليلة بجاه النبي هالليلة بجاه النبي هالليلة بجاه النبي وبجاهك هتفنا يرعانا بعين اللطف يرعانا بعين اللطف بارينا ويحبنا بارينا ويحبنا ونرعى 